daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. I wonder if this story makes you uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable. I wonder why it does that. Does this not seem to fit with the Jesus we find elsewhere in the scriptures? Or does it not fit with the Jesus we want to see? Is it maybe this, con- this sense of conflict that Jesus describes that frightens us? Perhaps we think it is God's work to eliminate conflict rather than cause it. But I wonder, where might we have heard that? Because the opening verses of this reading today spell it all out for us. Jesus met such violent resistance. He was killed for doing the work that God gave him to do. So why would we who continue that work expect anything different? If the systems of the world are threatened by him, wouldn't they also be threatened by his disciples? It comes, then, as no surprise that the gospel and those of us who live by it will be in conflict with the rest of the world. The question is why? Why are the religious folks of Jesus' time so afraid of him? What is it about his message or his ministry that they find so threatening? I wonder if it's that what Jesus taught was too unlike what people were used to, especially those people of privilege. That they were afraid his teaching would supplant the faith that they grew up with. In fact, as St. Matthew wrote this gospel story, that was his reality. A growing Jewish-Christian movement within the Jewish establishment that had different ideas and different beliefs from the rest of the community. In some ways, it's a lot like our current context where... Protestant Christian majority is slowly declining in our country as our neighbors and children and grandchildren slowly turn away from the faith with which they were raised. So we might well ask the same question of ourselves. What is it about religious disaffiliation that makes us feel threatened? As I ponder that question, I wonder if in the end, beliefs and creeds actually have very little to do with it. Apart from a few high-profile exceptions that are always in the news, the new generation of a-religious folks have pretty much the same morals and ethics as the religious forebears. And so I wonder if the death of the church as we know it maybe isn't so much about changing of our morality, but more about feeling like we are being denied. I wonder if as society turns away from religion, it might feel like it's turning away from us. Calling our values and our beliefs antiquated or unnecessary. I wonder if watching the church die might sometimes feel too much like watching ourselves die. But as Matthew reminds us, the church was born in such a death. We've seen how the world treated Jesus. Why should we expect it to treat us any differently? In fact, the church has died many, many deaths since then. There are the big ones that happen every 500 years or so. Of course, like the Great Schism or the Protestant Reformation. But the truth is, the church is always dying. Every year, every week, every day. As new people come into Jesus' community, and that community is changed by them, as people leave that community, it changes. We welcome this change. We even pray for it. At the beginning of our worship services, we participate in this death through our mutual confession and our repentance of what we seek to leave behind, hoping and praying that God will change us. The church is a community formed by death. 
St. Paul reminds us that the baptism by which we become members of this community is a baptism into Jesus' death. Death is our starting place. The tomb is our womb, both as individuals and as a community of believers. Because we have died with Christ, death is nothing for us to fear. Instead, it is the means by which we are able to walk in newness of life. It's when we try to avoid that death, to find our lives, as Jesus says, that we get ourselves into trouble. I think that's why the world fears and resists Jesus. Instead of letting go of what no longer serves us to respond to his invitation, we instead chose to preserve what was familiar and comfortable. We chose to kill Jesus instead of our too restrictive faith. We sought our life instead of his. And we still lost that life, didn't we? We're not the same people we were 2,000 years ago. But those of us who throughout the ages have been willing to lose what is familiar and comfortable for the sake of Jesus and his message have found new life again and again and again. It's not that what's familiar or comfortable is bad or wrong. I don't want you to hear that. Every seed, for example, needs a tough coat to protect the germ from drying out or being digested or crushed. But when the time comes for that seed to germinate, that seed coat has to split open and be left behind in order for the plant to live. Our creeds, our dogmas, our institutions, all those things have served us well. That's why we have them. But we also need constant reminders that those things are not the same as God, not any more than the plant is the same as the seed. We often speak of reformation or renewal or revival as though we are leaving one old bad way of being for something new and correct. As though we had been in a wrong place and need to get to the right one. But I've come to believe that rather that faith is not a destination at which we need to arrive, but a process, a way of being. It's a process of continually shedding what is comfortable and familiar when it's necessary to step out into what is unfamiliar and new and frankly sometimes frightening. It's a way of life that relies on God rather than the things that we have built. A way of life that sees God active and alive even in death. It's kind of a tragedy, I think, that we would rather calcify and fortify our little seed coats for our own protection rather than expand beyond them when we need to, but it's also completely understandable. We fear what we don't know, because what we don't know could hurt us. And sometimes it does. And I believe that's why Jesus calls us to die. Why we are baptized into Christ's death. From the very beginning of our lives of faith, we are already acquainted with that which we most fear. So that when we encounter it, and we will, we do so following a guide who knows the way through. It is my hope and my sincere belief that God is leading the church through this next death into a new existence. One that will be as different from the church we once knew as a stalk of wheat is different from a grain or a dandelion, different from those puffy little seeds children blow into the air. If we are willing and able to lose our beloved community in the pursuit of Jesus' message, I have no doubt that we will find it anew. I believe this because it is the story of every death, every day. As hard and as painful as letting go is, the act of letting go always points us back to God, if we have eyes to see. God who is always bringing new life from death. Every death 
bears witness to this reality, including the death we are experiencing today. Agnus Dei will not be the same congregation next week that we are today. This is always true, but today it is perhaps truer than usual. Who you've been, who you have been, who I have been together for these last eight and a half years, that's dying today. And it is appropriate to feel sad or angry or frightened about that. What rises will be different in ways that we cannot predict. This is an occasion for grief, but not for despair. Rather, it is also an occasion for hope. And that hope is what allows us to love and support one another in the midst of this grief. To act out of our conviction of what is to come, rather than out of our fear or panic or anger. Because this is a community baptized into Christ's death, we trust that this death is nothing to fear. That by grace and the creative love of God to whom we belong, we also will walk in newness of life. The life we've shared together over these years has been good. It has been creative. It's been a blessing. And now it is time for a new life. Both of these things are true. As good as this life together has been, today we let it go, and we allow it to let go of us, trusting in the new thing that God is about to do. As you look ahead to what is next for you, may you not be enslaved by what has been, seeking to regain or repeat what once was, but may you be open to receiving God's new life, even if at first it is strange or unfamiliar or even a bit frightening. This is my prayer for you. The lives we have, both as individuals and as a community, are gifts from God and rightly to be celebrated and cherished. But at the same time, recognizing those gifts, I think, allows us to hold them lightly, to trust that the gifts themselves are not God, and to trust the giver of all good gifts. If our fists are too full of what we already have, we may find ourselves unable to receive what God is offering us next. However, if we're willing to let go of what we have, we, who knows what God may be preparing to bless us next. I believe this is true for this congregation, as well as for the whole Christian church and for the whole world. Each time we face death with grace and hope, we bear witness to this truth. We testify to it, inviting the world around us to do the same, to leave behind fear and anger and hatred, and to act out of love and hope. And that new life that we receive proclaims to the world the good news of resurrection, just as we have known it. And so, even in our grief today, even in our grief throughout life, as we let these things go, we know that, as Paul says, we do not grieve as those who have no hope. We know that those of us who lose our lives for the sake of Jesus find them. And so that's what we keep doing, seeking Jesus.